Alright, wow, I just realized it's been a while since I've been making this film review. So I think the last one I stopped on, as you can see, is Ghostbusters Afterlife. And ever since then, I have watched a bunch of movies, just I haven't had the time to actually sit down and, uh, you know, uh, break, in, you know, like, do a breakdown on them, just because they haven't been very exciting. To be fair, there was a bunch of movies which I found interesting, but overall, they're not really standouts. They're not really movies that you're going to be talking about years from now. It's not really... Uh, fit for some of the classics and so what I'm going to do is compress this particular video and give you a, a 3x3 or so uh, film review. So first of all I'm going to finish up all the 2021 movies that I kind of missed out that I feel deserve a review uh, and I'll be just telling you their ratings pretty uh, you know pretty easily. Uh, so for the first one is Encanto. Um, this is a non. This is a spoiler review first of all. So I will. I might point out spoilers in between, but I don't think I want to go into too detail for these movies just because there's not really that. Uh, you know that many. There's a lot of things in the movie, no doubt, but it's not really that many things that I feel are you know worthy of making the movie some super awesome, amazing thing. So, uh, Encanto was a, was a, you know, it's, it's a Disney film. It's one of those Disney films where you have a lead uh, female cast. Disney likes to do this. This is, this is why Disney has a lot of princesses, because they want to sell a lot of pretty toys. And they feel that the easiest targets are, of course, uh, little girls. Because little girls are very, um, what do you call it, stubborn and demanding. And every dad and mom has a soft spot for them. And eventually, maybe not the moms, but the dads that definitely have a soft spot for their little girls. And uh, it definitely will get them the toys that they like. And just why Disney promoted the Disney princess agenda a long time ago. And we've arrived at Encanto where we have a new uh, somewhat uh, Disney princess. They're not really princesses anymore, which is something that's pretty impressive. One thing I do like is how these girls nowadays in these uh, Disney movies are actually taking good lead roles. And they don't really need a prince charming to come and swoop and save them or whatever. They're able to stand by themselves and actually do things on their own and they're not entirely Mary Sue's either which is a good thing like in in Encanto um, we have this Mirabelle right uh, and she's not an entire Mary Sue she actually struggles uh, her life is miserable a lot of things don't go well for her and uh, you know the family like the rest of the family actually has these magical abilities that actually help them to improve the village and the entire town knows them as this magical family uh, and it all started with uh, Mirabelle's, I believe, grandmother, who actually has the ability, who actually like lost her husband during a very uh, horrible battle when they were being hunted down by the uh, I don't know some uh, some invaders and whatsoever into their village. And I'm not sure who they were depicting the the the, the raiders as specifically. But uh, I get it, you know, it's kind of the thing that happened to the South Americans as well as uh, the actual American people, the indigenous people of the, of the land itself, who actually suffered from being invaded by, uh, you know, other colonies and whatever. And it's just horrible times. And it's not any different today because out there, uh, Russia is invading, invading Ukraine. And my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine. I really hope that, you know, uh, people don't lose their lives unnecessarily, but... It's just a horrible situation, as is. Anyway, getting back to the story and the plot. Um, so Mirabel actually doesn't have it easy because the rest of the family actually has powers. She doesn't. And she's miserable at everything else that she does. Uh, but the rest of the town doesn't have any powers. So it doesn't feel that bad, actually, because Mirabel is just, just basically us. Like, she's normal. You know, she's not special like the rest of the family but it's just that she feels left out from the rest of the family because of this lack of powers and so she's a little bit more uh you know like investigative and you know uh, she likes to uh find things out about how everyone else is doing in the family she she actually cares for the family a lot as much as her grandmother does it's just that her grandmother always finds her as sort of this uh unimportant child because she doesn't have any power so they feel like she's just a third person in the family uh, and that's basically it. And so all the powers are there among the family members, interesting and whatever, but they're just mostly there to use to do day-to-day -day stuff. They're not superheroes or they don't go out saving the town from things. They just go out and help people. Like there's this girl who's really strong. She helps people carry donkeys and uh, do farm work and whatever. And then there's this other girl who can like sprout flowers or something. So she actually just helps people sprout flowers in the garden and whatever and grow things and, and that sort of stuff. And... Um, there's one more girl who can apparently uh, cast a weather or control the weather or whatever around her. 
and that's it. They're this basic, very very simple powers. They're not like like city changing abilities or town changing abilities. Uh, and until until Mirabel discovers that there is actually this one sibling that was kept in the shadows, and his name is Bruno, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. There we go, Bruno. And uh, Bruno is um has gone missing ever since like Mirabel's time when she went to uh you know try out her powers or something and bruno apparently has a very uh he's actually the most powerful basically he he has the power to look into the future uh, and he has to do a very huge enchantment just to get it working but it's really powerful because it actually allows him to see what's going to happen in the future and even then it's not very clear about the things he sees and whether it can be changed or not changed and you know you have the dilemma of oh if it's in the future it's going to happen but if it's the future we should be able to change it because now we know what's going to happen that sort of simple dilemma nothing really interesting to that we've seen that a million times uh and then there's like you know, she she uh, is shown to not have any powers all the way up to the uh, very, very end. And then, you know, the rest of the family starts losing their powers as well because something is affecting them, a curse of some sort is affecting the family that's causing them to lose their powers as time goes on. And uh, there, there's like this sort of candle lamp, which is where the grandmother gets her powers from originally. And the lamp is sort of going out and uh, it's causing everyone to lose their powers. And everyone's going to become normal. And oh my God, that's like the worst thing in the world because the family, uh, they're afraid they'll lose their purpose in the village because they'll become normal like the rest of the village. And then eventually you realize it's not a, such a bad thing being normal. After all, the village actually accepts them. Uh, Mirabel makes them understand that most importantly, it's all about family, family, family. And eventually towards the end, I thought they're actually going to settle for being normal people, which would have been the icing on the cake for the story. But no, Disney got to pull out their magic shit. And so everyone gets their powers back. And Mirabel too realizes that she actually has uh, the power to sort of save the family. Where when Mirabel goes to unlock the rebuilt house door, the house basically comes back to life and all their powers get restored because... The story start, sort of starts where the grandmother actually... So this is my theory too, because it's not really explained in the film. So I, I, I'm just trying to theorize this. So the grandmother never actually had powers of her own. But ever since she was able to uh, get this blessing of some sort, uh, she erected this house in the middle of this town. And that house was like this magical house that can think and act for itself. And then the rest of her uh, gen new generations all got powers. And she was trying to keep them all protected. By making sure they have powers to show to everyone that she's powerful and she's amazing. And it was very clearly a very selfish thing. But uh, what if Mirabel's power is the same as the grandmother? Mirabel doesn't have her own powers, but she has the powers to continue to uh, produce people who have powers, you know, her offsprings and whatever. And also, she's actually linked to the powers of the house. She's able to erect the house just like the grandmother did, just that you can't see it happening because there's already a house there. So this is just my theory that her powers are the same as the grandmother, which is basically nothing that you can see right away, but she controls the house and the family and is sort of the leader in the family. Uh, and that's the way I see it. So if you ask me, Encanto is a so-so film. It's not really something that amazing or, or anything like that story-wise. But animation-wise, it's absolutely brilliant. The music-wise is fantastic. Music is lovely. Uh, there are some musics that are, you know, you can use like on a day-to-day -day basis. But a lot of the songs actually have names of characters in it. So it's sort of like, uh, you know, fit for the film itself. Uh, but uh, then again, the animation and the music and, uh, you know, all of that is really, really good. Really well done. Disney quality for sure. Uh, but the story is just not really there for me and uh, nothing really that too interesting. No b major plot twist to the point that it's unbelievable. You know, I kind of expected Bruno to just be out there because Disney doesn't really kill off characters. We all know that. Uh, and they're not daring enough to actually take that chance as well to show that a family member actually dies because of something that Mirabel fails to do or, you know, they really regret the decision. No, it's just everyone's just pissed off at each other for, for something simple like not arranging the plates or something like that. Not not actually, but I'm just giving an example. So anyway, for me, Encanto, if you ask me, is a 4 out of 10 film. Great animation quality, great music. That's about it. Everything else is just meh. But of course, your kids will probably enjoy it because it's super colorful, super uh, you know, en en enjoyable in terms of it visually. Like You don't need to understand the story, right? And kids, basically, they don't understand the story most of the time. They just know the basic of it. Like, oh, it's a girl that has to love her family and then got no power. But in the end, she becomes powerful like everyone else. But I'm not sure what her power is. So yeah, something like that.
anyway, that's Encanto. Let's move on to the next one. The next one, a complete flip and switch, is a horror movie called Fear Street. And there are three parts. So there's part one, two, and three. And this is on Netflix. And I had an absolute blast watching these three films. Uh, I watched it together with my wife. And I, I told my friends as well to, to absolutely watch them. And they did watch it. And this is such a holistic uh, three-movie series, like a trilogy. And uh, it's very well done. Uh, the horror elements are very well done. There are some cliche moments where they show you, uh, you know, they point out the things that horror people in horror movies are not supposed to do, uh, and they point out how you know you get separated, you die, you you, uh, you know, some jump scares are going to show up, and just to just to pull your leg as well, and because jump scares are not real jump scares, they just like jump scares just to. Uh, make you feel like it's something that's going to scare you, but they're all just there to build attention. And at the end of the day, the real horror is just going to walk up to you and slash you in your face. So this movie was really good. Uh, three movies, and we kind of watched them back to back because we were super excited for them. And yeah, we totally sat down through like, I don't know, three, almost four hours just watching through these films, and we absolutely enjoyed them. So how this works is, in Fear Street, there's three parts. There's the 1994 uh, version, which is like the like the the today era in this film and then it goes backwards it goes to like uh i don't know the 70 something or 80 something and then it goes all the way back to the 1600s so it goes back from the today's generation to like the uh parents generation and then to like i don't know like a hundred like 300 years ago like so many generations back to the original story and all of it is apparently caused by this very powerful witch and um you know, they're all investigating the story of the witch and, you know, they're thinking that the witch is cursing the town and whatever. And they really give you the clues and the build up and the environment and the character building. Every character is cherished in this story. Uh, even if they're going to die, even if they're going to be slaughtered and brutally murdered, the story is not afraid of, uh, you know, actually throwing their characters into the lion's den. You know, they, they do brutally murder certain characters to show you that the stakes are there, the stakes are high. This is a true horror movie and people are really afraid and really sad and affected by things that are happening around them. It's just that certain parts, they crack jokes, like, not too long after some people die. And that's the thing that I can't really get, like, especially after brutally seeing someone getting murdered and whatever or some horror killer out there. Cracking jokes at those, those little moments are, I don't know, are they gallows humor or are these people just dumb? It's just one of these two things. And then there are also certain moments where characters do absolutely cliche uh, decisions as every other horror movie does. But I think it's done on purpose just to give some throwbacks to other films to show you that this is exactly how people die. Because if they don't do this, there's no way they're going to die. Like if people will actually smart by watching horror movies, there's no way anyone would die uh, in horror movie fashion. Uh, so they kind of throw you those little Easter eggs and whatever. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of reference to 90s and the gaming and the pop culture community uh, because, you know, all of this is an era of the 80s and 70s and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful camp moments like, you know, in like this kids camp and whatever. Uh, and uh, also character building between each character's romance, uh, you know, uh, love triangle and those sorts of things. It's just so well packed and so well equipped. It's really ready to show you anything and everything and gives you I think it's very holistic and even stands up to the likes of, um, what do you call this, uh, Stranger Things. Yeah, it definitely stands up to the likes of Stranger Things. It even has one of the kids from uh, Stranger Things, right? It has that, uh, what's the kid's name? Hang on, let me look for it. Uh, it's this guy. Uh, do we have him here? Unless I don't know his name. Uh, Oliver Julia. As you can see, a lot of female cast, but it's not really that. There are a lot of guys actually, you know, doing their own thing. Is it Daryl? I don't know. His face is so far away. It has to be one of these guys, right? No, it's not this guy. Uh, it's one of the um, one of the Stranger Things cast actually. But anyway, uh, really well packed and well. Uh, the story is pretty cool as well, and it really builds up. And there's a lot of suspense and drama. And even in the end, there's a good twist. Uh, there's two good twists actually, and both of them are pretty interesting. And uh, towards the very end, they you know ended on some sort of a cliffhanger just to tell you that yes, horror movies should deserve to end in a cliffhanger just to leave that 
that ill, unsatisfied feeling in your heart that deep down there's all these evil lurking out there. And I love that ending. It's so good. Uh, for me, this movie is actually one that IMDb didn't rate properly. I think it deserves a much, much higher rating just because it was so well written, so well done, the character building, the story, uh, the atmosphere. And sure, despite all the cliche moments, I think it deserves a much higher rating. For me, Fear Street... Uh, all the three parts, one, two, and three. I'm not sure if this thing rates all the three parts. Like, that's something... Oh, there we go. That's two and three separately here. But regardless, it looks like all of them have got a six point something in the rating. Uh, which is really strange. Did not expect them to have such different ratings. Uh, yet all quite similar to each other. Or six point something, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, uh the 1666 is the oldest one. Uh there we go. And then 78 is the uh parents generation and then the 94 is our the latest present day generation. And all of them are pretty interesting. So yeah, it's pretty cool uh how well that was taken and also the transition among the different things. And uh they show you certain characters young and old and Sometimes you're a little, you're guessing a little bit, but then eventually you just warm up to understand that yes, these are the exact characters. And then 1966, uh, the, the 1666 especially was very interesting because they reused the cast from the the present day to sort of act in the past, because it is more of a preview of the past through the eyes of this girl that sees it through the eyes of the uh, the sort of the witch Sarah Fear who is in the past, the very end. And then I really like the twist. And I don't really want to throw that away. Despite this being a spoiler review, I think I'll keep that little twist in the end. Uh, but there is a pretty good twist uh, on top of the story of Sarah Fear. And um, yeah, it's very well written, very well done. And for me, Fear Street 1, 2, and 3 combined as a total, which I think deserves to be the way it should be rated because I watch all three in one go. And the story is interconnected. For me, this is an 8 out of 10. I think it's an absolutely uh, amazing three-part film trilogy uh and yeah it's a must watch absolute must watch all right the next one is don't look up another 2021 uh film which was also pretty interesting and pretty funny and whatever uh but this is just so annoying it's like made so annoying on purpose adam mckay you piece of crap like you may be a good director or whatever but you just made us so irritated by seeing how stupid americans can be and they really show you um like, you know, this very dumb, blonde sort of American president uh, played by Meryl Streep. And, uh, you know, Jonah Hill being another more irritating uh, person in the story. Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence are the only two people who are actually trying to uh, find out what's really happening. So as for the story of Don't Look Up, basically there is a meteor coming towards Earth. And these two astronomers, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, have discovered that this meteor is coming. They have the evidence to prove it. But no one in America takes it seriously. Uh, and then you have this Mark uh, Rylance, uh, who's playing uh, Peter Isherwell, who's sort of the Steve Jobs character in this story. So everyone's sort of like uh, mirroring some sort of real-life character just to poke at them. Uh, I think this one is the, um, what's that person? Hillary, Hillary Clinton. I think Meryl Streep is sort of a Hillary Clinton here. Uh, and Jason Orlean, I don't know which dumbass uh, states, a secretary or vice president or whatever he's supposed to be. But this is clearly uh, Steve Jobs, I think. Uh, but it's sort of a mix of one or two characters. Uh, and then these two people are sort of the us in the story. And they go absolutely nuts as time goes on. And there's a lot of in-between stories, but it's basically how people go crazy when everyone realizes that no one is believing these two uh, astronomers for discovering that an that a asteroid is actually hitting towards Earth and it's going to kill everyone. And everyone's taking it very relaxed. Like, no, nah, it's never going to die. We've survived so many apocalypses. There's no way this is going to happen. This is not just another false hoax. Another thing to just put up in the papers, get some clicks, make some money out of it. Another publicity stunt. Another way to make movies out of it. Another way to just get people to talk about it. Uh, you know, just that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, they even show how the, the, the newscasters are just so jovial and so high about it. They don't care. Uh, Kate Blanchett as well plays a newscaster who just wants to bang Dr. Randall Mindy just because, you know, he's so hot because of Leonardo DiCaprio, right? I mean, who wouldn't? But then again, uh, they're just throwing a lot of other crazy stuff out there just to fill up the story. And um, in, the, in the end, finally, everyone just die from the <laughs> meteorite spoiler. Uh, everyone just die from it. And it's just like that moment when 
you know, you realize that despite telling everyone, everyone is just not going to be ready for it, no matter what, and you're all going to die. So for me, this one has a decent story. It doesn't really have any character development. Characters, I feel, are pretty much the same throughout. It's more so the build-up and the, uh, what do you call this, how crazy everyone gets as a whole, like, affected over time. But some of these people, like Dr. Randall and Kate, uh, who is his assistant, they get affected by it very early on, and they say, stay the same throughout the film. Like, they do do their little things here and there just to get their mind off things, but then their characters get reset as time goes on, as they realize the meteor is coming closer and closer, and then as everyone realizes the world is going to end, everyone's going to go into mass hysteria, and they start uh, robbing, killing, raping, all these kinds of things are happening. Uh, but Rock to- Dr. Randall Media and Kate are pretty much observers in this story they don't really get into the action they don't really get involved in destroying the meteor in any way it's all up to this uh steve jobs or i'm not sure if he's also sort of taking a poke at um uh what's his name uh the tesla guy uh oh crap you guys are gonna hate me for this uh haven't heard from him in a while actually the tesla guy whatever so um yeah, not sure who is actually taking a poke at, uh, but they actually build like some sort of defense mechanism to go onto the meteor and then destroy it. And they don't really want to destroy the... They don't want to send the meteor away. They actually want to break up pieces of the meteor because they want to harvest the meteor for very valuable resources that are on the meteor that the Earth is starting to lack because we're going towards a more technological era. And then that uh, experiment goes horribly wrong and the meteor doesn't is not able to get destroyed. And so Peter Ishavel takes off in a spaceship to save his own ass. And then the meteor hits the Earth, destroys all life on it. And then finally, uh, you know, hundreds of years later, uh, Peter Ishavel and a whole bunch of elites are frozen in ice in the spaceship. And then they finally come back to when the Earth is already fully reset itself and restored and life has started to prosper again. And when they land on Earth, they get killed by the wildlife there, which is super funny in the end. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So for me, uh, it's an okay story. It's not that great, but it's still something unique and interesting. But it's just so irritating. I'm going to rate it a 5 out of 10 just because it's not that enjoyable to watch, honestly. Uh, you have a great cast and you have meh dialogues. Dialogues are not that great. Uh, you have that build-up and the tension in the film that you can feel throughout. But it just doesn't feel very real until the meteor actually shows up as I think intended in the film. But for me, it's just not that original, not that enjoyable. It's just another one of those doomsday films. It's just taken from the perspective of the people who are more observers rather than those who take action, which makes it sort of boring for me. Uh, but yeah, it's more drama, I guess, is what it is. So if you guys actually enjoy the drama behind the scenes, like not being involved, I think this might be a film that you'll enjoy. But for me, no, it's just not something that I would actually like. So don't look up. 5 out of 10 That's what it is for me. Dota Dragon's Blood. So I watched season two. Um, you know, it just came out. And uh, uh, honestly, I love season one. I, I think I rated season one an eight out of ten or something. And nine out of ten went for Arcane because Arcane is just better than this one. Uh, I, I Dragon's Blood maybe a seven to eight. I think it was a seven. I can't really remember. Seven to eight. But season two came out and I watched it just recently. And it's not as good as the first season. And... Yeah, I, I, it's a bit unfortunate for me to say that. But yeah, it's not really as good as the first season. And so I'm going to have to rate season 2 a 5 out of 10, honestly. Just because it had a lot of boring moments. A lack of character, like further character building was lacking. Uh, we expected more things to happen between these characters who have been built up in season 1. Like this was the time for them to shine, time for them to do things. Most of the events happen to Davian, who, who turns into a dragon and then fights people and then turns back to normal after getting beaten up and then turns into a dragon again, fights people. It's just sort of that repeated story. Mirana actually has a thing happen to her where all of a sudden she wants to rule the kingdom to try to do things as a princess or whatever. Things don't go according to plan. Uh, Invoker, once again, doesn't really have that arc that he had in the first season. Uh, and, you know, he's, he sort of loses in this season compared to the first season. First season, we saw Invoker winning against Salamene in all in all aspects. In this one, Invoker is actually losing to Salamene. And I didn't know he's being voiced by Troy Baker. That's interesting. But anyway, in this one, he is actually losing to Salamene. And Salamene is regaining her powers. Uh, Luna is getting closer to Mirana as best buddies. But she's just crazy still. She's just doing her own thing out there. 
uh, killing people, getting caught, killing people, getting caught, that sort of thing. Mirana is actually the only one I think, and Davian I think, are the only ones who are actually having some sort of a development in this story. Mirana is actually wanting to be a princess to try to solve things from the kingdom's perspective. But all of that is being ruined by this evil guy who is sort of the advisor to the king. You know the evil advisor cliche thing as usual. There's one evil advisor who's actually the real mastermind behind everything. Turns out to be that's the case. And Davian is sort of learning to master his dragon form gradually as time goes on. But they're sort of making him just be that character who just can't fully realize his powers yet. So he's still developing. But he's also still the last dragon that stands to be the only chance to sort of fight Terrorblade, uh, who turns out to be the ultimate villain in this entire story. So you have Salamene, uh, who is regaining a power. Uh, uh, Invoker is losing his grasp on her. Terrorblade is also getting even more powerful and becoming more of a threat. So I think there's further build-up in this season leading to season 3, which is why I feel that this season is sort of just a cliffhanger season. It's just more steps taken uh, after season 1. Like, I, I just hope the climax would come a little sooner because they already done that character building in season 1. Further character building, not very necessary unless you're bringing in new characters, which is totally understandable. But here we have the same characters going through the same story again. Uh, not really many new characters introduced. Quite frankly, none from what I remember. So, yeah, there is that. But there's more backstory to each and every one of them, which is fine. That is that is what it is. Uh, so, season 1, probably a 7 or 8 out of 10. Season 2, I think it's a 6 out of 10, pretty much, if you ask me. Uh, just because it's not as good as season 1. A lot more boring, not that much character building. Uh, I would even rate it a 5 out of 10. I think fair to say. Just because I expected more out of it and it didn't really deliver. And after such a good first season, you'd expect a bit more. Especially considering there are just far more better competitors out there like Arcane, Which really showed you what you can achieve in a single season. So there is that. Uh, but I'm not going to lower season 1's rating. Season 1 deserves its uh, 7 or 8 out of 10. But season 2 is definitely, I think, a 5 or 6. It's nowhere, nowhere near 7 or 8. I don't think it deserves a, a great movie rating. Uh, by any means. So anyway, there's that. Uh, beyond these are all the 2022 films, uh, which I've also watched. And I'll make that uh, those those reviews in another episode. So yeah, it's been great. Uh, I highly recommend you guys to watch some of these. Encanto is great for your kids. Um, nothing that interesting story-wise. Uh, you can listen to the songs and watch the animation. Those are pretty fun. Fear Street, a must-watch. One of the best horror films. Uh, out there, I think, I dare say that, uh, an 8 out of 10 overall for me, if you watch 1, 2, and 3, all together, it's an 8 out of 10, uh, really, really good horror series, uh, really fun, very down to earth, very relatable, uh, cliche a little bit, but still all the throwbacks and the easter eggs and the references, I think it's just fun, it's just super fun for a horror series, and it is scary, it is scary, there are moments that are pretty good. And especially that Ruby Lane, I think, was pretty creepy. Uh, she comes out singing, You always hurt the ones you love, or something like that. It's pretty creepy, I think. That's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, this one, solid 8 out of 10. Uh, must watch. Uh, don't look up. Super irritating. If you guys like irritating American films with dumb blondes and dumb white guys and just white people in general. I don't see any black people leading the roles here. I'm not sure if that's even done on purpose, but it's just so irritating. Uh, you can watch it for the cast. and. To be irritated if you're feeling super relaxed. I think you want to feel irritated. This is a good movie to get your blood pumping. Uh, especially if you have a low, bl low blood pressure or whatever. 5 out of 10. Uh, Dota Dragon Split. 6 out of 10 season 2. Season 1 is an 8 out of 10 must watch. Season 2. Uh, meh. I think better wait for season 3. So that after you watch season 2 it's not so much of a cliffhanger for you. Uh, but that's it. These are the 2021 films that I ended my uh, year with. That I didn't make reviews on. So here they are. I'm sorry I haven't really been doing this for a while. I've been having a really unfortunate uh, two, three months actually. Uh, ever since December, uh, end of December, and then January and February, I've attended three funerals of, um, you know, three people that have been very dear to our family, me and my wife's as well. And yeah, it's just been one after another. And, you know, you guys just take care out there. Be careful. Uh, take care of your parents, your grandparents. You know, times are hard. And... Um, you know, uh, you know. I mean, I mean, I know people say pray for Ukraine, but I really hope there's more we can do, and I hope more things will be done by these world leaders. Because uh, if prayers are all the rest of us can do, then those people out there with the power to do something should. 
Uh, so I really hope that that ends well as well. See you guys in the next one. Take care. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for dropping by. Uh, I don't usually tell people to subscribe, but you know what? I'm just going to try my luck for it. Do subscribe if you have not already. And if you guys love some gaming content, movie content, those sorts of stuff, very casual about it in this channel. Uh, you guys are welcome to join. Take care, guys.